So when I was a kid, this movie came out, and it was one of my favorite. How many of you have seen Willow? How many of you remember Willow? It's, wow, great. It's perfect. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of old school. This is, I think it came out in 88, um, and I remember just loving Willow. And really, the story of Willow is about this, uh, this guy who finds a baby that's like the, this princess, and he has to take it to the cast. It's just it's very fan, fantasy-oriented. But here's why I think I like the movie. It was all about an adventure. It was, it was one big adventure, and it was one big journey. And there's something about a, an adventure movie that has some sort of big journey involved in it that we're drawn to. I mean, think about some of the great classics of literature. I don't know if you call these great classics of literature or not, but, I mean, The Hobbit. Like most people, I have not read the book. I've seen the movie, though, right? And it's what's, what draws us to fantasy stories? Like It's the adventure, right? It's, it's this journey from from lowly beginnings or this lower, low life to, to something much greater. And the same thing happens with the, the Lord of the Rings, right? You got to get a Lord of the Rings reference in every three or four months in a sermon. So here it is, right? I mean, what's this, what's this about? Why are we drawn to stories like this? Because it's all about the adventure. It's all about the journey. 
And I think it's true and fair to say that, that our, our life is like that. And I don't know if you've ever been. That's a little hard to see. When we were in Peru, we'd go on these treks every summer, and we'd spend two or three days walking through the mountains. And for us, as we, it was me and my teammates, it seemed like we were, like, trekking across the globe, right? Probably in the grand scheme of things, it was like 10 miles. I don't know. But we were trekking through the mountains. It seemed so far from everything. And I think, and it were all these, like, Lord of the Rings sort of moments with the waterfalls and the mountains. The biggest Lord of the Rings moment that I remember is we were hiking through the mountains. It seemed like we were far, far removed from any sort of um, anybody, any person. And we came around this, this mountain, and there was this woman. That's my teammate Gary sitting there. This woman sitting in the middle of nowhere on the side of the mountain sewing, and she was selling potatoes. I really felt like I was in Lord of the Rings in that moment because, like, where did she come from? We bought some potatoes. They were delicious. But as I look back and reflect on moments like this, I think what creates these such fond memories is just the journey of it all, right? Because we sometimes refer to life as a journey, don't we? Even though we may not go very far from home, even though you may live in McNary County for your entire life, you still refer to life as, as a journey, right? Well, the, the journey of life. And sometimes we even refer to life as, as talking about where we're going and where we've been. And we haven't really gone anywhere or been anywhere. It's just we're talking about life. We think of life in a journey. And I think that's why we're drawn to these sorts of stories, right? Because when you think of life or a story that's a journey, there's something about that. I think in the way that God has created us that draws us into that adventure. And we like to think of our lives as a journey or an adventure, and maybe that's why we're drawn so much to the book of Acts, because Luke is telling about this epic adventure, this journey from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the world. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 8, he, he says, here's what I want you to do. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we've traced this entire story all the way up through chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, turn them to Acts chapter 20. We're walking through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. And we've watched this grand journey and, and all that Paul does to get the gospel, the story of the gospel to this point, and the story of the early Christians to this point. And we come to chapter 20, and what amazes me about this chapter is it's just more of this epic journey, right? Last week in, in the message, and I look back at Dad's PowerPoint, haven't watched the sermon yet, need to go do that, but he showed you some maps, right? And in these first six verses of Acts chapter 20, he goes from, from Ephesus, which you can kind of see in the middle of the screen there, see if you can find it, and he goes all the way up into the yellow part, Macedonia, and he goes all the way down to Corinth and all the way, all the way back up, right? And by the, by the end of chat, by the, in the first six verses, he's all the way in Troas. It's up to like a year or two of time that that takes, and it's described in six verses. And so Luke's just like, look at this grand adventure that Paul goes on. And then what amazes me is he zooms in on one little night with one fairly insignificant person, right? You talked about Eutychus last week. Why does Luke tell us the story of a boy who falls asleep during church? Honestly, I don't know. Because there's, there's, it's not significant. It's not significant enough. There's nothing about that story that makes us think, wow, that's very impactful on my faith, other than you shouldn't fall asleep in church, right? Why does he include that? Except to show that, yeah, Paul's out about the big journey and the big adventure, but those little moments matter too. Those people like Eutychus who seem so insignificant, they matter too. But then he leaves Troas, and in verse 13 and following, it's more grand adventure, right? He's leaving Troas, and he's going from island to island to island, and he ultimately ends up in Miletus, and we're like, wow, look at all that Paul does. And here it is again. We get this little intimate moment with some people that Paul is really close to. Look in verse 17 of Acts chapter 20, where we're picking up today. Now from Miletus... He sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, and we'll look at his speech to him in just a second. Remember that Paul was in Ephesus for three years. You think he got close to anybody during the amount of time? Do you think that maybe these elders from the church in Ephesus were people that he had brought to faith, and they viewed him as a spiritual father? I imagine in those three years, he developed some really close relationships. 
and he knows he's probably never going to have another chance to see them again. And so he calls them from, from Miletus. You see it kind of right there in the middle of the screen down below Ephesus. He sends word to Ephesus and says, come, come down to Miletus. Remember, Paul started a riot in Ephesus, so it's prob probably not a good idea for him to go up there. So he skips Ephesus, and he has just this intimate little, so you've got the big picture, big journey. And then Paul talking to maybe just a handful of guys. And there's some beautiful insights in it. In fact, I want, to, I want us to read it, and I want us to see some of these beautiful phrases that Paul used to describe his ministry, because I think these phrases are meaningful to us in that they ought to describe the way we're living as well. Look at this, verse, verse, 20, verse 18. When they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility. What if that phrase, serving the Lord with all humility, was descriptive of, of our lives, of, of your life? You see, the word here for serving the Lord isn't the word for like ministry. It's the word for slavery. And so there's a sense in which when we choose to follow Jesus, we become his slave. And I know that that word has a different meaning for us in the past 200 years. But in the ancient world, it, it had a, a serious meaning. We are servants or slaves of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a powerful thought? Doesn't that change the way you do, do what you do? What if everything we did? Whether that was in service to, to church, related to church, or whether that was with our family or on the job, we simply humbly surrendered ourselves to God and said, God, I'm just your servant. And we didn't feel the need for any thank yous or any attention. We just did it because we view ourselves simply as humble servants. Jesus said these hard words in Luke chapter 17. Here, here's what it is. This is powerful. He says, would any, would any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he's coming from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and after your word you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? Here's the modern day parallel. If you've got an employee, or let's just say you're doing your job every single day, do you expect to be thanked every day for the work that you do? Well, you're going to end up pretty disappointed if you expect a thank you every day when you're on the job. Sometimes you may only get a thank you once a year or something like that, right? We don't, we don't expect it. Here's what Jesus says to his followers. So you also, when you've done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what, what was our duty. What if we viewed our Christian faith in that way? I'm just, I'm just an unworthy servant. I don't deserve any of this. I'm just doing what God has called me to. I'm just doing my duty. Paul seemed to view his life that way. He said, we're just a servant, serving the Lord with all humility. Watch how he continues. He says in verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. In Ephesus, it was the Jews who caused a lot of that trouble. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. In verse 27, he says, I did not shrink from teaching you the whole counsel of God. Paul says, it doesn't matter. What it was, I was, was going to tell you what you needed to hear. The whole counsel of God, anything that was profitable. There's no question that Paul was bold. And there's no question that as followers of Jesus, we're called to be the same. We are called to be bold. you know what that means? That means sometimes we're going to have uncomfortable conversations. That means sometimes we're going to stand for what's right when we're the only one standing. That means sometimes... Even in our gentlest, when we're talking to people in the gentlest, kindest way, we're going to isolate ourselves. But ultimately, just like Paul, we are bold. Watch how he continues verse, the middle of verse 20. He says, I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Paul was versatile. I mean, there are times that, that he's talking to big crowds, hundreds, maybe even thousands. He wanted to go in the theater in Ephesus in front of 20,000 people. But he says, I did that. I did this public thing, but I also went house to house. We're called to be versatile and take advantage of whatever opportunities God gives us to share the message of Christianity. If I'm honest with you, and this is going to sound really, really weird to the vast majority of you, I'd rather stand up in front of a group of people like this any day than sit down in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with folks 
about Scripture. Now, some of you are just saying, you're stupid, right? That's who, who would rather stand up? But that's just, it's personality. I am much more, give, give me a thousand people, give me chapel at free to any, that's no, I don't get nervous about that, but student contacts me and says, hey, I need to talk one-on-one. I'm just like, I don't know what he wants to, I, I don't like it, right? I don't like it. But this, this doesn't bother me a bit. But you know what I've, I've got to learn? I've got to learn to do both. Now, I am not saying that all of you need to learn to stand up in front of large groups of people. Because I know that not every, a lot of people aren't comfortable with that. What I am saying is, regardless of the situation, we've always got to be ready to step in and speak a word for the Lord. If that means it's in a public situation, great. If it's in a private situation, great. But we've got to be ready because we are versatile. And you're saying, I don't know about that, man. Here's what I know. God gives us the Holy Spirit to strengthen us and help us and equip us for whatever situation we find ourselves in. We keep reading. Watch what else Paul says. It's just jam-packed with these beautiful phrases and words. Verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, doesn't matter who they are. I'm talking to everybody about my faith. That's a reminder to us today that we share with everyone. Everyone. We cross barriers that keep us separated from other people. And you, can, you know the barriers. There's, we can make a long list of them, right? We're different from people in a lot, other people in a lot of ways. There are economic differences. There are ethnic differences. There are nationality differences. In our world, you've got all the political differences. There's all sorts of things that separate us from others. And our world wants to build walls between us and other people. But you know what the gospel does? It tears those walls down. And for followers of Jesus, it doesn't matter who that other person is or how different they are from me. What do they need? They need Jesus. They need good news. And we share with everyone. He continues, verse 22, And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. We're going to, in chapter 21, see that a couple of different groups of people tell Paul, listen, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go, please don't go to Jerusalem. But he set his mind to it, and he knows that wherever he goes, it's not going to be easy. Now, here's the deal. We're pretty fortunate. Even as Christians in our, in our region of the world, in our region of this country, we are very fortunate and anytime something just goes a little bit south or someone gives us a little bit of a hard time, we kind of lose our minds. And we've been saying it all through the book of Acts. We need to be thankful for the freedom we have, but we should not expect that following Jesus is going to be easy. It's not last Sunday. We, we attended church in Bangor, Maine. And if you travel around and attend churches in different places, it makes you thankful for what you have. But this was a, a small church, and they were just thankful to be together. But I imagine it's, it's hard. It's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to show up to church when there's, and, and the preacher prepare to preach every Sunday when there's just a handful of people. That's tough stuff. And that is more of the reality of what Christianity has been like over the last 2,000 years than what we experience. And sometimes we need the reminder that we're really blessed at the same time. We need the reminder that sometimes it's not going to be easy. It's not always going to be as, as good as we sometimes have it. It's not going to be easy. Paul knew that. Watch how he continues, verse 24. Listen to this phrase. But I, so he's going to suffer, but here's why he can do it. I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Let that phrase right there sink in. I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. Sometimes we sing the song, I am mine no more. And doesn't that encapsulate the attitude of Paul? What if, what if every Christian took that phrase, that, that sentence, I do not account myself, my life of any value nor as precious to myself. What if we adopted that phrase as, as a description of who we are and we allowed that to define not only who we are but the way we're going to live? Imagine how that could change our perspective. Imagine how the world would view us differently. Right? Christians catch a lot of flack in our culture, and some of it is our fault. Because we're not always as Christ-like as we should be. We're selfish sometimes. We yell and get mad. But what if, 
What if the world saw us living like this? Imagine the impact it would have. Imagine the difference that this would make in our families and in our jobs and with the people around us and our neighbors. This is not my life. I am mine no more. But we keep reading. There's more. Verse 25. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Paul says, I'm not going to be back here. And we don't know if he ever does make it back or not. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He said, I caused a riot in Ephesus, but I promise you, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Verse 28. Listen to these instructions to the elders. And we'll read these verses. Listen close. So he's talking to these, to these elders. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. So elders, you've got to pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's the word for bishop. To care for, that's the word for shepherd, to shepherd the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So here's Paul's direct admonitions to these elders from Ephesus. But here's what I think this says to the rest of us. If this is what elders are called to, then the rest of us ought to be respecting the shepherds for the stress that they endure doing those things right there. Because those, just those three little bullet points, right? It's easy for those of us who aren't elders to look at those three bullet points and be like, yeah, that's not too bad. Boy, there's a lot of stress and a lot of sleepless nights right there. So for the rest of us, it's a reminder to respect the sacrifices that our shepherds make. But tucked right in the middle of this, do you see what Paul says about the church? This is the end of verse 28. He describes the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Listen, Jesus did not just die for your personal relationship with him. Now he did. It's, it's reasonable to say Jesus died for my sins. But the Bible also says that Jesus died for all of us together. Jesus died for the church. And so it's not just about me. It's not just about what I want. We are a part of something bigger than ourselves. When we choose to follow Jesus, we're choosing to join a, his family and be a part of something bigger. And really, we don't have a choice if we're going to follow Jesus. If, if we're going to follow Jesus, we will be a part of his family, of something bigger. You know the problem with that, though? Sometimes people are difficult. All of us at times are difficult. And so if you're going to be a part of a group of people, you can expect problems. And so this won't always be easy. But we're part of something bigger than just ourselves. Look at verse 32. His speech continues, And now I commend you to the God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Listen to this little thing he says. He said, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, you yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to all who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And we'll stop there for a second. What did Paul do? He worked hard, and he was thankful for what he had. I mean, isn't that pretty good life advice? Here's the, this isn't just life advice. This is the word of God. Work hard. Be thankful for what you have. And he says then, here's what the, the end result of that is. Must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know where Jesus said that in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? It's not there. These are some unrecorded words of Jesus. Now John says at the end of his Gospel, if if we included everything that Jesus did in this story, it would what? There wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it all. And apparently that's true with some of the words of Jesus. Because here's a phrase that you can go, you can go you don't, some of you don't believe me. Like, uh-huh, he did too say that. I'll find it. Go find it in the Gospels today. This is Paul telling us something else that Jesus said. But isn't this phrase really descriptive of what the whole gospel, what all four gospels are about? And the life of Jesus? It's more blessed to give than to receive. 
And watch how this ends. Again, we've got this big picture, epic journey stuff. And watch how this, we get this intimate little moment. Look at verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Boy, we got all these big picture moments. Paul traveled here to here to here, and then he zooms in to this little moment when they kneel and pray and hug and say goodbye. You see, our lives really are a journey, and you see the journey of the story of the gospel in the book of Acts, and you see it in, in this story, but it's also true that your life is a journey. And somehow, like Paul, we've got to figure out how to manage the big picture adventure of life and the little details. Of life. That's what I love about Acts 20. You get big adventure and little details. And somehow, as we face this journey of life, we're going to experience the same thing. Are there some big picture things you have to deal with in life? You bet. Are there some daily details that seem fairly insignificant that you also have to deal with? Yeah. Somehow Paul, in the story of Acts, tells us about both. Paul figured out how to do both. The big picture and the daily details both matter. They both matter. As a church, this new building is going to be built over here. That's a big picture, isn't it? That's about the future. And that's important. We've got to be thinking about the future and big picture. But you know what else we've got to be thinking about? Our relationships right now. Our interactions with one another this morning. As a Christian, you've got some big picture stuff to think about. You've got to think about long term. We're thinking about an eter eternal life. And that could tempt you to think, well, the, some of these little things don't matter. It doesn't matter if I show up at the next church fellowship. It's, that's no big deal. But you know what? Those little moments matter too. Like big picture and the daily details. With your family. Well, let's go with job first. I'm a big picture guy. I like to think and dream big about the whole semester that's coming up. I don't like to sit down and like work out the details of the semester and grade papers. But you know what I have to do? I got to do both. On your job. There's some big picture and planning things that you probably do, but if you just kind of skip out on some of those daily details, you're probably going to get fired, right? We get this on our job, that the big picture and the daily details both matter. But this is also true just of life in general and family life in general. My yard is not a big picture thing, is it? Mowing my yard. In the grand scheme of things, who cares if my yard gets mowed? But you know what? My yard has to get mowed, doesn't it? In the grand scheme of things, maybe a 15-minute conversation with your spouse in the evening after a big day doesn't seem like all that big of a deal. But you go daily for a long period of time without those sorts of conversations. If you don't pay attention to those daily details, what's going to happen? The big picture is going to be messed up. I don't know what this looks like for you. I don't know where, you, I think we all kind of lean one way or the other depending on what, what it is we're facing. But somehow we've got to, like Paul, figure out that the big picture, epic journey, adventure of life, that stuff matters. And we can't let the little details cause us to lose focus on the big stuff that matters. But we also can't get so focused on the big picture that we fail to focus on the daily details of relationships that God gives us the opportunity to deal with every single day. So what's it going to look like for you? To find this balance between the two. Aren't you got, glad that God had the big picture in mind from the very beginning when he set forth this plan to send Jesus into the world to die for our sins? Man, I'm glad he had the big picture in mind. But I'm also incredibly glad that the Bible says he cares about each one of us. See, the details matter to God as well. This morning, if we can help you in any way at all to help you with some big picture stuff, salvation, eternal life, man, we'd love to help you with that. Maybe there's just some little details that, that you need prayers about or prayers for. We're here for you. 
We want to help you in any way that we can. Let's stand and sing together.